If you want my notes, you can text notes to the number that comes on the screen, and what's in front of me will be sent to you. If you have your Bibles, turn, turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7, and beginning in verse 30, it says this, after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of the burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. He approached to look more closely. Someone say closely. The voice of the Lord came to him. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare look. Verse 33. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Someone say holy ground. I came to tell you this morning, the primary job of the Holy Spirit is to make us Christ-like. The title of this message this morning is Strengthening the Foundations of Our Faith, Make Me Holy. Let's pray. So Father, we declare that your word is true. Let every man be a liar. We declare your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, minds to understand what your spirit is saying. Father, I declare right now, I ask you to breathe upon your logos word, your written word. I pray it would become alive. Let it become rhema right now. Lord, we declare no spirit, but the Holy Spirit is welcome here. Holy Spirit, we don't make room for you. We give you the entire room. Father, I thank you. Nobody came to hear me. We all came to hear you. So we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. And all God's people said amen. And amen. We are stewarding a word over the year of dunamis, that this would be a year that his dunamis power would strengthen and fortify us. Dunamis is when the Holy Spirit's power goes from resting on you to abiding or dwelling in you. And so we're teaching on the foundations of our faith, how to strengthening and fortifying your faith as, an, as, as a follower of Jesus. Last week, Pastor Clay preached on submission. I listened to that word online. How many were blessed by that word of submission? How many need to grow in your submission? All of us, this beautiful word. And so these are topics that are so important to the foundations of our faith. So this morning, I wanna teach on holiness. And you can't begin to understand holiness unless you understand the Holy Spirit. Now, I can preach every single week for the rest of my life on the Holy Spirit. It is my favorite topic because it is my favorite person because it is, the, in my opinion, the most important relationship of the Godhead, the Trinity, because our relationship with God is through the Holy Spirit. Mercy Culture's statement of faith on the Holy Spirit is this. We believe in the person, the gifts, and the move of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, the Lord, and the giver of life who was active in the Old Testament, given to the church in fullness at Pentecost. He empowers the saints for the service and witness, cleanses man from the old nature, and conforms us into the image of Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, subsequent to conversion, releases the fullness of the Spirit and is evidenced by the fruit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Can someone say amen? The Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune God, but not third in priority. Now, we mention him in order, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but what has happened in mentioning him as the third person is it's become the third or last priority where God the Father is so important, Jesus is so important, and I, we can live with or without the Holy Spirit where we have devalued and dishonored the Holy Spirit. But let me help you with your, your theology, that the Holy Spirit is as equally God as the Father and the Son. Now, four people are clapping because you grew up in denominations with bad theology. And, and, and we treat the Holy Spirit not like our intimate friend, but we treat him like a weird uncle that comes over for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then you're like negotiating with your family members. Okay, could he have to go on Christmas and Thanksgiving? Could he just come to one? Can we just have a Holy Ghost spirit? You know, how, how about one Wednesday night every other year in the back room and then we'll push everybody into a closet. We'll have a Holy Spirit time and, 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 and then no more. Or even worse, how about that we've made everyone welcome in the American church except the Holy Spirit. It's not accidental that we pray, we don't make room for you, we give you the room. 
it's wild. I know pastors, they're like, well, well, you know, how, how do we get God to, you know, oh, we want the Holy Spirit to move like he does at Mercy Culture, but, but we don't want to lose control. I was like, the problem is you're a control freak. I'm talking to the pastor, not you. Don't worry about it, okay? I'll talk to you in a second, though. And, 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 and the, the Holy Spirit's not going to move in your church because you want to move in your church. And you want the Holy Spirit to make you look good, but you're afraid of the Holy Spirit making you look bad. Your own leadership makes you bad. You don't need the Holy Spirit to make you look bad. It's a funny thing because... We want a little bit of fire, but not too much fire because that fire will start consuming and burning us. Now, it's easy when I talk about prof my profession, but what about when we talk about yours? Where is the Holy Spirit welcome in your marriage? Is the Holy Spirit welcome in your parenting? Is the Holy Spirit welcome in your business? Are you about the Father's business on Sunday and then your empire Monday through Friday? Is he, is, he, is he welcome in your business deals? Is he welcome in your friends? Some of you have church face on Sunday and then you live like heathens during the week. I told you I'd get to you. Is he welcome? But what we've done is we've diminished the value of the Holy Spirit. We've realized we desperately need him. The Holy Spirit, this is so important, is as equally God as the Father and the Son. Matthew 28 and 19 says this, therefore go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the unseen, least recognized member of the Trinity because he allows Jesus to do ministry and he, hide, he hid behind the scenes. And this is how we should behave and respond where we allow the Holy Spirit to do ministry as we hide behind him, amen? We say this at Mercy Culture, the best thing that you can do is give all attention to God. The worst thing that you could do is bring it on yourself. Here's the truth is, is where there's order, there is freedom. And I've seen when we have biblical order, we have the move of the Spirit at unforeseen, uh, unforeseen measure when we have the order of the Lord, amen? The Holy Spirit has God works. What do I mean by God works? It is the attributes only accredited to God. He is as equally God as the Father and the Son. We see the Holy Spirit is eternal. Someone say eternal. Eternity is the concept of endless time or more fully or being beyond time where only God is intrinsically eternal. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He was before time. He is outside of time. He is eternal. We see this in Hebrews 9, 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God? Scripture says the Holy Spirit is eternal because it is part of his God works. The Holy Spirit is what we call Omni, someone say omni. Omni is a Latin word that means all. And there's a lot of omni words that begin to describe the God likeness or the God works of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a few. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. That means he is present everywhere all the time. Psalms 139 verse 7 says, where shall I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? He is everywhere all the time. The Holy Spirit is omnipotent, which means he is all knowing, having infinite awareness or understanding and insight. First Corinthians 2 says, uh, 2 10 says the spirit searches all things. Someone say all things. So he knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're doing. He knows everything. He knows all things. The Holy Spirit is omnipotent, which means he is all powerful. He has the power over all things, all times, in all ways, everywhere. Luke 135 says this, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power or the dunamis of the most high will overshadow you. So the Holy Spirit is all powerful because he is all God. Let me give you three examples of his power. The Holy Spirit's power was in creation. 
creation. Genesis 1-2 says the Spirit was hovering over the waters in the beginning. The Holy Spirit was a part of the creating of the world because he is all-powerful. The Holy Spirit is a part of your regeneration or when you get born again. He's the one that makes the old man alive new, new in Christ or new by the Spirit. We see this in John chapter 3 where the Bible says that you must be born again. So he has the power to create uh, the world and he has the power to create a new creation inside you. We saw the Holy Spirit's power in the resurrection where Romans 8, 11 says this, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life. So the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit's power is what is ra- is what raised Jesus from the dead. Someone say power. So we see he's all God, all eternal with all power. Someone say omni. Then he has these beautiful fruit. The fruit of the spirit are his attributes. It's his characteristics. We know there's nine fruit of the spirit. We find them in uh, Galatians chapter five. It's love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, depending on what translation you were raised in. Uh, Heather preached last uh, night or two nights ago at the Mark Conference on the fruit of the Spirit. If you weren't at Mark Conference, I'd encourage you to go listen to that message as she begins to talk about what is true spiritual fruit and not man-made-up substitutes. Then we have nine gifts of the Spirit. Gifts of the Spirits are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They are wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, power, prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and distinguishing between the spirits. Uh, uh, We taught an entire series on this last year. You can go watch the YouTube. We taught on every single one of these um, gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us. These are the gifts of, of the Holy Spirit. The Lord told us at the beginning of this year that in the year of dunamis, that this would be a year that we would memorize scripture. I would encourage everyone in the church, memorize Galatians chapter five and and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Get the fruit of the spirit in you. Understand the gifts of the spirit. It's really easy to memorize. Even children can do it. Let me show you. My child does it. Jackson Portal Adam Shaw. And how old are you? Four. All right, tell me the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now give me the gifts of the Holy Spirit. What goes first? Wisdom. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, power, Blossy, speaking tongues, translation tongues, between two spirit. Good job, bud. Turn your neighbor and say, you can do it. I believe in you. (laughs) But for real, my four-year-old can do it. You can do it. (laughs) We have symbols of the Holy Spirit that represent the Spirit all throughout the Word of God. We see him like a tapestry woven into Scripture. We see him as fire. Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist says that Jesus is coming and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and of fire. We see the refiner's fire all throughout the Word of God. We see the pillar of fire in the Old Testament. We see the the bush on fire, fire, which I already mentioned in Acts chapter 7 and Exodus chapter 3. We see the symbol of the fire of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost. Speaking of Pentecost, we see in Acts chapter 2, the wind, where like a mighty rushing wind, it came into the presence of God. He moves in wind. I'll be in services constantly and all of a sudden I'll start feeling the wind of the Holy Spirit blowing. It's not because these fans, we just got them this week. But before that, I would feel the wind. All of a sudden in services, I would feel it move. It usually when I'm in services comes from this side and goes to this side and you'll feel this blowing of the Holy Spirit. In fact, one of the greatest personal encounters of, or daily encounters I've ever spent my entire life, I was sitting on a dock on the Sea of Galilee in Israel and I was worshiping as the sun 
was coming up. And I remember just this breeze of the Holy Spirit was just washing over me this entire time. In fact, the Bible talks about the ruah of God or the breath of God or the wind of God that comes and blows. So we see the symbol of wind. We see the symbol of water where we see in John chapter three, the, the symbol of breath. We see a symbol of light where we know he is the, this, the, the lamp of God or the light of God. First Thessalonians 5.19 says, we do not extinguish this light. We see him as a seal in Ephesians chapter one. We see him as oil with the wise virgins or in Zechariah chapter four, verse one. We see the symbol of a dove in, in Luke's gospel and in every reference to the baptism when Jesus was baptized by John and the Holy Spirit came and ascended like a dove. There's these symbols of the Holy Spirit. Not only that, but there's expressions of the Holy Spirit. Scripture refers to it as the seven spirits of God, which there's just one Holy Spirit, but this Holy Spirit has different expressions within himself. We find this from Isaiah chapter 11 in the book of Revelation. In fact, Mercy Culture Worship wrote a song about it called The Fear of the Lord, where we're singing these scriptures from Isaiah 11 in Revelation. What are these seven spirits of uh, the Holy Spirit? We see the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of power, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. But I wanted to tell you this morning, the Holy Spirit is much more than a symbol or an expression, but the Holy Spirit is a person just like Jesus is a person. Now, this is where you really have to uh, uh, push down and drill down. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're about to spiritually grow. Because so many people want a relationship with Jesus and their relationship with God strains, but you don't realize that you can have a relationship with Jesus just like the disciples had a relationship with Jesus. Your relationship with Jesus is with his spirit. So watch the same way the disciples walked and talked with Jesus is the same way that you can walk and talk with the spirit of Jesus the Holy Spirit. Have you ever watched a show or a movie or read a Bible study or, or a Bible story or, or watched Chosen or something and you see these guys walking and talking with Jesus and say, oh, I, just, I wish I could interact with Jesus like that. Church, you can. But watch this, the same way that the spirit of religion, the religious people persecuted Jesus in the flesh is the same way the spirit of religion persecutes the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity means this. If he's a person, he has a personality. How do we know he has a personality? Because we see examples of it all throughout the word of God. We see the Holy Spirit has a mind. Romans chapter eight, verse 27. The Holy Spirit has a will. First Corinthians chapter 12 tells us. The Holy Spirit has feelings or can be grieved. Another way to say it is that you could actually hurt the Holy Spirit's feelings. Ephesians 4.30 tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. So let me just ask you this question. How do you feel the Holy Spirit feels? How do you think he feels walking into churches in America where he's not welcome? Where Holy Spirit, you can be here as long as you have a seat belt on. As long as you don't embarrass us. Have you ever had a friend that treated you one way when you were alone and then when you got around to other people treated you differently? Maybe that's how the Holy Spirit feels. Where we begin to treat him differently be, by who's around us. We begin to alter our behavior. See, we could grieve the Holy Spirit by our actions, by our words, by our behavior, by our heart condition. He has feelings and he can be grieved. You can lie to the Holy Spirit. We see this in Acts chapter five, where Ananias and Sapphira thought they were lying to their leaders, their pastors, the apostles, but they were actually lying to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. You can commit blasphemy, or blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? You could be defiantly irreverent to him. You could on purpose, be irreverent to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has behaviors or actions in his personality. What are some of those? Scripture says he is our helper. John 16, seven, I love this. Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go because when I go away, I'm gonna give you a helper to come to you. 
His name is Holy Spirit. This is wild. Jesus said to his disciples, they're with him in the flesh. He said, it's better for you that I go. Could you imagine that? It's better for the disciples of Jesus that Jesus went. Why? Because Jesus as man was at one place at a time. But the Holy Spirit is omni. He could be all places, all times, everywhere with everyone. He said, watch, I'm teaching you now, but the teacher's going to come and he's going to talk to everybody all the time, all at once. You have immediate access to him. He said, watch, it is better for you to come because he is your helper. Don't you understand that the Holy Spirit loves to help? Anyone have any kid helpers in the house who aren't that helpful? but they think they're helpful, but watch, they love to help. They love to cook. They love to help clean. They love to pick up. They're not that helpful, but they love to help. See, the Holy Spirit is helpful and he loves to help. What does he do? He really does clean up your mess. He really does pick up behind you. He really does help you get to the next place. Listen, when you can't do it on your own, he helps you. Listen, he's like a child that loves to help, loves to be involved. And it's all you have to do, watch, is let him help. I feel the Holy Ghost. A lot of you have trouble that you have in your life right now and the helper wants to help, but you gotta wanna want him to help. Turn to your neighbor and say, let him help. Turn to your second choice, say you too. The Holy Spirit reveals God's heart. Second Peter 1 21 says this, for no prophecy ever produced in the will of man. But men spoke to God as they were carried along in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will reveal God's heart to you. Do you know if you ask him for his heart, he'll give it to you? Do you know every single day I ask the Lord for his heart? Every single day. And then what I'll find, I love this, is when you ask him for his heart, the next thing the Holy Spirit is he begins to direct you. And he'll begin to direct you in his ways. Acts chapter 16 is an awesome example where you have the the disciples or the apostles now. The apostles are full of the Holy Spirit, were baptized in the Holy Spirit's fire in Acts chapter 2. They're in the process of taking the gospel all over the world. Are you with me? These are the ones that walked and talked with Jesus. Now Paul has joined them. Paul's went from Saul to Paul. Okay, they're taking this all over the world. These are good men doing good things full of the Spirit. Are you with me? These are good men doing good things that are full of the Spirit. And they had plans to go into a place called Bithynia. But as they were going into Bithynia, this Bible says that the Holy Spirit kept them from going. Now, we don't know what it means when he kept them. Either the door shut, he spoke audibly, something happened. But they physically could not get to the place that they were trying to go. Now, Watch this. Sometimes you can have a good heart and love God, but you're missing his will. And just because you thought it was a good idea and you went to the two years of leadership school or you did this and you put this plan together and you think you're ready, it may not be, watch, his heart or the direction he wants you to go in this timing. Has anyone ever felt like they had timing figured out, but your timing and God's timing weren't the same timing? I remember when Heather was pregnant, it was awful for me. Security restrained her in case she gets out of control. The worst thing you could do is bring attention on yourself. The best thing you could do is give attention to God. And I remember when she was, when she was uh, you know, you know, pregnant, um, my, my wife's very meticulous. She's very ordered. She's very strategic. She's got it all figured out. But she couldn't have the baby when she wanted to have the baby, despite how many times she spoke in faith she was going to have the baby on that day. And she would get pregnant, figure it out. She's like, all right, we'd have this baby on this date. And this date means this. And these numbers mean this. And this is great. And we'd have the baby on this date. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then the due date, due date came and it came. And she, she's so excited and it went past. And then the next day and the next day and the next day. And I'm watching like bitterness set in. <laughs> And it was day six. And day six, she's like the size of the, the garage and she's sitting in the house. And she says out loud, what? what I say? what I say? Okay. I'm trying to accurately tell the story. <laughs> okay. And, and she says, she goes, eh, I don't even think I'm pregnant. I'm like, I don't even know how I'm gonna get you in the car to get you to the hospital. What do you mean you don't know if you're pregnant? (laughs) I'm just telling the story how it happened. Don't, Don't kill the messenger. Hold on. 
She's six days past due and she goes, I don't even think I'm pregnant. <laughs> Hun, I said, babe, it's okay. Watch, you don't get to choose the due date. There's a point in here somewhere. Come back to me. Come back, church. Come back. Come back. Half the church just left right there. Half the church just left, okay? Okay, there's a lot. <laughs> okay. You could have plans. You could have everything figured out. You can do all the timing that you think that you want. Watch, it doesn't mean it's God's perfect will. Listen, you could have right hearts, right motives, right intentions. You could be a good person. You could love God. Watch, and it doesn't mean it lines up with God's heart. But the beauty of the Holy Spirit, watch, he keeps you. Watch, and even when you're doing things out of good intentions that you shouldn't be doing, watch, he's so good, he's so kind, he's so merciful, he keeps you from the things in the places in the wrong seasons in the wrong times to keep those, watch, that are asking for his help and his direction, he will give them his help in his direction. What else does the Holy Spirit do? He testifies. He witnesses. I love this one. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. That's a spiritual word for praise. Do you know the Holy Spirit prays for you? Now, this is wild. Do you know how you know when the Holy Spirit's praying for you? When you're praying in the Holy Ghost. When you pray in the prayer language, Jude 120, build yourself up in the most holy of faith. When you are using the gift of speaking in tongues, he is interceding with you. When, he, you. when you are using words or groans unknown, he's doing the same thing with you. The Holy Spirit prays and intercedes with us. Romans 8, 26 says this, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings, watch, too deep for words. Beautiful. Every time we pray in the Holy Ghost, we're inviting him to pray with us. This might be my favorite one. The Holy Spirit speaks. Do you know when you hear God, you're hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit? Oh, it blows my mind how many people resist the Holy Spirit and reject the Holy Spirit when he's the one that speaks. And then you ask people if they could hear the Lord or when was the last time they heard God speak to them and they can't give you an answer because they don't hear God, because they don't talk to God, they don't know the voice of God because they kick the Holy Spirit out of their life because he's a weird uncle. So they never learn to hear his voice. Watch this. According to scripture, God is in heaven and Jesus is where? at the right hand of the Father. So if he's at the right hand of the Father and the Father's in heaven, where's Jesus? But remember, he said, it's good for me to go because I'm gonna give you a helper. He has much more to say to you. So he gave us his spirit, which is the voice of God. Church, listen, when you hear God, you are hearing the Holy Spirit talk to you. He is the voice of God. I love the voice of God. John 16 tells us he has much more to tell us. Then the Holy Spirit teaches us. This is so beautiful. John 14, 26 says this, the helper will come and he will teach you all things. What will he teach you? All things. Do you know one of the best prayers you can pray? Let me give you some practical advice. Holy Spirit, teach me. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're dealing with, you're struggling in your marriage, Holy Spirit, teach me how to be a better father. I better be a husband. Teach me how to be a better employee. Teach me how to run a better company. Teach me how to be a better leader. Holy Spirit, teach me how to be a better servant. Holy Spirit, teach me how to forgive. Holy Spirit, teach me humility. Teach me submission. Listen, there's nothing off the table. Holy Spirit, teach me. When you invite the Holy Spirit into your life and ask the teacher that Jesus promised would come and help you, when you start asking him to help and teach you, watch, he comes and helps and teaches you. Listen, he's just waiting for an invitation. Someone say, teach me about everything. You didn't have to say that part, but I love the enthusiasm. <laughs> teach me about everything. Teach me about anything. Help. This is what he does. The Holy Spirit has many names that people refer to him by or scripture refers to him by. 
We see he's the spirit of God in Genesis 1. He's the spirit of Christ in Romans 8. He's the comforter in John chapter 4. He's the promise in Joel chapter 2. He's truth in John 15. He's grace in Hebrews 10. He's life in Romans 8. He's adoption in Romans 8. But more than any of those names, he has one primary name that we came to talk about today. And what God refers to as himself, watch, is holy. There is no word that describes God, not one. But if there was one word to begin to describe God, it's his name, holy. What does holy mean? Holy means set apart. What what does that mean? It means this, that there is God and then everything else. There is our God and then all other gods. There is God and then all of humanity, all of creation. He is separate. He is other. He is separated from everything. He is holy. Someone say holy. This is his name. And watch, this is so important. The primary job, I just listed gifts. I just listed, uh, listed fruit. I, I, I listed powerful things, all of these attitudes, actions, personalities, everything. I, I mentioned all this amazing, cool stuff about your relationship with the Holy Spirit. He comforts, he helps, he talks, he speaks, he does all of these amazing things. And yes, I love all of those things about him. But listen, this is so important. Hear what I'm telling you right now. The primary work, the primary job, the chief obligation of the Holy Spirit, why? is to make you Christ-like. No, 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 not to make you move in signs and wonders. Not to get you to prophesy, not to get you to speak in tongues, not to have you do signs, watch, not to make you wealthy, not to, not, not to bless you, not to do any of these other stuff. Watch, the primary work, this is it, at the core. If, if you don't get this, you don't get it. If you don't understand this, you missed all of this. The primary job of the Holy Spirit, watch, is to make you like Jesus. When I say holiness, here's what I'm saying. Holiness is the separation or to be set apart from his creation. At the same time he is set apart, he is pure. Holiness, watch, is the quality of being personally dedicated to God. So on Easter, I talked about salvation. I talked about the three stages of salvation or the process of salvation, where the first part is justification. It's when you're guilty, we're all sinners. And he says, not guilty, even though you are guilty. He says, not guilty. The second is regeneration, where this is where you are born again. This is where you become a new creation. We'll post this on video for, on social so you don't have bad videos about it. There you go, okay. The second is this regeneration. The regeneration is when you're born again. You're a new creation. Then the third process is the sanctification. And this is when you become Christ-like or you begin to live like Jesus. Watch. This is holiness. This is the process of looking like him. You need to hear me today. It's not the process of your haircut. It's not the process of the length of your dress. This isn't the process of wearing makeup or not wearing makeup. This isn't about behavior modification. It's not about looking apart. It's not about a theology. Watch, it's about the process of beginning to look like the one you are close to. And here's the thing is people struggle with this and, 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 and they stay in this, this cycle forever and they, they, they have a hard time and you have a season where you do good and then you fall away. And a season where you do good and then you fall away. And this, there's this battle. Paul says, I'm I, 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 I beating my flesh into submission. This is the battle against the flesh and the spirit. This is the journey that the saints of God are on of living a life that reflects Jesus. And so many people are trying to do things and have accountability and, and, and have strategy and all of these different things and I'm not saying do those things but I'm saying at the end of the day there's one way to find holiness and it won't be through anything that you do in your own strength you want the strategy is all you're doing is getting as close as you can to him we've made it so hard 
Well, if I, you read your Bible enough, read your Bible. That's a great thing to do. I encourage you to do it. But don't read your Bible to be holy. Read your Bible to get close to him. Well, if I pray long enough, and then it's not about a prayer. It's not about how you pray. It's not who you pray with. It's not who you pray in front of. Listen, I'm all for prayer. I want you to grow in your prayer life. But the, the reason is not to grow in your prayer life so that you become more spiritual. It's so that you're close to him. Listen, it's not about coming to church, but church isn't enough. Because some of you guys come to church every other month, and you know it's not enough because you've been struggling for years. But even if you came every week, it's still not enough. That's why the vision of this church is to go from corporate encounters to daily personal encounters. Do you know why? Because it's not enough to go to a church. There's not enough that we can do for you. There's not enough pastoral care that we have for you. There's not enough friends that would meet your needs. Do you know why? Because you're needy. you got needs in your life. You have problems in your life. You have issues you're going through. Watch. It's not enough. The only thing that will do it is being close to him every day. There's not a secret to your daily encounter. That's why we have all these different ways. We don't care how you get in. I don't care if you run on the trail. I don't care if you bake a cake. I don't care if you sing a song. I don't care if you talk to a flower. I don't care what you do. I don't care if it's evergreen. I don't care if you do it like women or you do it like men. I don't care if you like loud music, quiet music, soft music, slow music, fast music. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is you learn how to connect with God. Because when you connect with God, it's easy to get into his presence. When you get into his presence, you start looking like him. When you start looking like him, his holiness comes on you. This is not a game. I didn't give my life. I didn't move here not knowing anyone to set up a church to have church. I grew up in church. I've had enough of church. I've had enough of the hypocrisy. I've seen, I had enough of the deception. I've had enough of the drama. I want nothing to do with it. The only thing I want is him. And I want him to be with me every day. I want him in our sanctuary. I want him in the foyers. I want him in the parking lot. I want him in the small groups. I want him in the children's ministry. I want him in the youth ministry. If we don't have him, we don't have anything. I'm preaching to you the vision of this church. Everybody wants the secret. What's the secret? You got a book for me to read? No. Well, what if I pray like you? It, it won't work. No, no, you're looking, you're looking for the strategy. Here's the strategy. You get close to him. As close as you can every day, you don't leave him. And then when you're close to him, he'll tell you, you're a jerk to your wife. Apologize that you said that she was the size of the crotch. Sorry. <laughs> I've been in here to preach and the Holy Spirit has told me, go apologize to your son. And I have to go find him in children's church and repent to him. Because I didn't discipline him in a loving way, he was in a harsh way. So I don't want him not to encounter God because his dad, who's the pastor, was harsh with him on Saturday. He should have made that goal, though. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Just relax, don't judge me. Man, such judgmental people. <laughs> when you get close to him, he'll tell you, erase the number, don't go there. Don't say it. Remember, he keeps you. Oh, he keeps you. He keeps you from the wrong friends. He keeps you from the wrong places. He keeps you from the wrong things. He keeps you from the right or the wrong apps. He keeps you from the wrong business deals where maybe you would make a lot of money, but you would lose your soul in the process. He will keep you. He will protect you. He will guide you. He will lead you. Listen, when you're close to him, he does the heavy looking, lifting. Listen, our pastors will serve you, but they can't lift your burdens for you. Our pastors will give to you, but they can't do it for you. Listen, only he he is the one that makes hard things easy. Only he is the one that makes crooked ways straight. Only he is the one to take your unrighteousness and make you righteous. Please hear me today. The strategy is not fixing you. The strategy is getting close to him. Turn with me to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. It's this. This is, this is wild. So I'm, I'm preparing my message and, and usually what I do is I sit in my office and I just ask the Holy Spirit what he wants me to do and then he starts talking because he speaks 
And the voice of God is the Holy Spirit. And when you talk to him, he talks back. I don't just say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening before I preach on Sunday. I say it all throughout the day, all the time. And, and, and I, I asked the Lord what he wanted me to speak and instantly in my spirit came Saul or Paul, excuse me. And then as I was praying into this, I just kept hearing closeness, 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 closeness. And as I was praying about closeness, I, I, I saw Moses with the fire and the burning bush. And then all of a sudden, as I was reading in Moses, Exodus chapter three of the burning bush, I was reminded about the story of Stephen, the first martyr, who's telling the story of Moses with the burning bush. And as he's telling the story, Saul, or the apostle later to be the apostle Paul, was overlooking his stoning. So the story of Stephen was he was a Hellenist. So he was a Greek-speaking Jew. He wasn't an apostle, but according to scripture, he was one of the first lay ministers who was actively defending the gospel publicly. He's defending the gospel. We know that he's a man of faith. We know he's full of the spirit. We know he's a man of courage. We know he's a man of character. And what he's doing is he's preaching to the Sanhedrin or the religious leaders, and he's testifying about the story or the journey of Israel from the beginning of Abraham. He begins to preach majority of the Old Testament, the entire journey of the people of Israel. As he's preaching of the children of Israel, he gets to the part of Moses in the burning bush. As he's talking about Moses in the burning bush, he talks about the story, how Moses saw the fire and began begin to go closer to it. And as he sees the fire, he begins to come close and then God begins to speak to him. Remember the symbol of fire that I already told you of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, God begins to speak to him from the fire and he tells him this. He says, stop, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. So he has him take off his shoes. He said, this place is holy. Now, what's wild is he wasn't in a church. He wasn't in uh, uh, in, in any kind of religious place. Remember, Moses was on the backside of the desert. He lived his life in three different patterns of 40 years. And so he had been in this place for decades in this area. There was nothing special about this place. He passed it all the time. But watch, all of a sudden, God said, the place that was familiar just became holy. What made it holy? He was there. See, you have to learn how to humble yourself or submit or be sensitive to holy places. You know what's something about when you take your shoes off, all of a sudden things feel differently. When you walk around barefoot, you have to be a little more careful because it's more sensitive. I remember when I walked around this building for 40 days and asked the Lord to give it to us. I said, if you give it to me, we'll give it back to you. It'll never be ours, it'll always be yours. And when I did it, I was barefoot. And the reason why is because I felt I, I need physical sensitivity to the spiritual journey that I'm going into. See, when you're, when you're barefoot, you're more cautious on where you step, watch. You're more reverent to where you're going. See, when you realize you're in the presence of God, you're more cautious about the things that come out of your mouth. You'll hear the Holy Spirit. Does he, don't say that. Don't go there. Don't do that. Don't engage any farther. You'll feel that check. You'll feel that, that leap in your spirit. You'll feel that, that resistance. You'll feel that kept you from Bithynia kind of moment. Well, don't talk about that. Don't say that. Stop it. You'll feel those checks where the Holy Spirit kind of just nudges you, pushes you. Watch. You're more sensitive in your spirit. So Moses was walking on holy ground. He's at the place where God was. And Stephen is talking about this moment. Are you following me? So Stephen is preaching to the religious people about their hero, Moses. Because remember, Moses was more famous than Jesus to the religious community. So he's talking about their hero and how their hero took off his shoes and walked on holy ground with the burning bush. And when he started preaching to them, they started getting furious. They started, scripture says, gnashing their teeth. And the Bible says this, that they begin the process of stoning him. Do you know what stoning was? Stoning was when they would huddle up around an individual and they would corner them. And then they would take large rocks and boulders and begin to break their limbs so they couldn't get away. And then they would begin to bash in their head with big, large rocks. This was the stoning process. And they're in the middle of this, they're stoning Stephen. And as they're stoning Stephen, here's what the scripture says. Look at Acts chapter seven, verse 54. It says, on hearing this, the members of the Sanhedrin were enraged. They gnashed their teeth at him, verse 55. 
But Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. He looked intently into heaven and he saw the glory of God. Look at this. And Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Look at verse 59. While they were stoning him, Stephen appealed. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Verse 60. Falling on his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sins against him. Watch this. Let me ask you this question. Who else prayed like this? On the cross, he says, Lord, don't hold their sins against them. Forgive them. And then he says, Lord, I offer up my spirit. Watch, Stephen is praying the same prayer that Jesus was praying. Why? Because when you get close to him, you start sounding like him. When you get close to him, you start acting like him. When you get close to him, you start forgiving like him. When you get close to him, you start blessing those that persecute you like him. When you get close to him, his behavior, all of a sudden comes your behavior. And here's what the Bible says, watch. It says that Jesus was standing up. Now, as far as I've seen, there's only two verses in the Bible that talks about Jesus standing up off his throne. Because traditionally, Scripture says that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. So watch this. Jesus is normally sitting. But when he sees one of his sons walking towards him, getting close to him, he stands up, and I believe he stood up because he started walking towards Stephen. And here's what the Bible says in Acts chapter 6, that Stephen's face began to shone like an angel. The same way that Jesus began to transfigure on the mountain, watch, he was so close to him, he began to reflect him. Church, I'm telling you, this is the strategy of holiness. It is not about your behavior. It's about your closeness to him. And when you're close to him, his holiness begins to come upon you, watch, and as you come Come close to him. He comes close to you. You're not holy. He is. You just start looking like him. Watch. And as they're stoning him, our first martyr is smiling. Because hard things become easy in the presence of God. And someone come get on this piano with me. Here's what I came to tell you today. That holiness is when you begin to look like him. Holiness is that part of sanctification where you start acting like him. You start forgiving like him. You start praying like him. Where it stops being about you and it starts being about not my will be done but your will be done. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all over this place? I wept all week preparing for this message. I'd be on runs on the trail or sitting in my office. And I just begin to weep because I felt him close. And despite how close I am to him, my heart's cry is always, I just want to be closer. Lord, I just want to be closer. I felt the Lord prompt my heart to end this service with practical advice. When you go through MC Connect, there's a daily encounter guide. And in the daily encounter guide, there's suggestive prayers. And these are the prayers that I've been praying for years and years and years. And they're reflections of the Lord's prayer. Where Jesus says, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name or holy is your name. 
And for years when I go and spend time with the Lord, and I start out my prayer time, I say, Father, you're holy, you're holy, you're holy. Jesus, you're holy, you're holy, you're holy. Spirit of the living God, you're holy, you're holy, you're holy. And the reason why I pray that is because the Bible says in the book of Revelation that the angels who are closest to him, it's the only thing they see. It's the only thing they declare that every time they circle him and they see another aspect of his glory, they cry the louder, holy, holy, holy. Scripture says without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I found that as I learn how to come into the presence of God and encounter him on a daily basis, when I begin my time with the Lord by recognizing his holiness, it's so easy to come into the holy place because I'm declaring that's where I want to go. That's where I want to be. I just want to be closer to you. And recently, I found a new prayer come out of me. When I, in my daily encounter, I say, Father, you're holy, you're holy, you're holy. Jesus, you're holy, you're holy, you're holy. Spirit of the living God, you're holy, you're holy, you're holy. I found myself praying, make me holy. Make me holy. Make me holy. I just want to be close to you. I felt that we are supposed to close this service with a daily encounter just doing it corporately I was in my office praying about this moment and I saw a spiritual daydream of me inviting you to this altar but you were removing your shoes and you came barefoot as close as you could so you don't feel obligated to participate, but I would invite anyone who wants to to come to this altar right now, all over the balcony. If you're watching online or any Mercy Culture community, just find a place to kneel, remove your shoes, and let's find holy ground. Come as close as you possibly can. Get as close as you possibly can. Even in the balcony, I would encourage you, make your way out of the balcony. These are one of these moments. Find your way, even if it's, it's on the stairways, as close as you can to the moment. Any person that says, I just want to be closer to you. I just want to be closer to you. I just want to be closer to you. If you're in an aisle and that's as close as you can get, just find somewhere where you can kneel. online, find a place that you can kneel. Pull your car over, stop running, whatever you're doing if you're at work, find a place where you can go kneel. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to declare the Father is holy three times. That Jesus is holy three times. The Holy Spirit is holy three times. We're going to declare what the angels are declaring. And then as many times as you want or need to, would you just start saying to the Lord, make me holy. So Father, we declare you are holy. You are holy. You are holy. Jesus you are holy, you are holy, you are holy. Spirit of the living God, you are holy, you are holy, you are holy. All over the sanctuary we declare, Father, would you make us holy? Would you make us holy? Would you make me holy? Would you make me holy? I pray right now, the wind of the living God, I pray right now, let the Spirit of God fall in this place, all over this place. Just begin to pray. Just begin to pray. Make me holy. Just begin to pray. Make me holy. Just begin to pray. Make me holy. All over this place, I pray right now, come Holy Spirit, come. I pray right now, our desire is to get close to you.
Our desire is to be close to you. Our desire is to be close to you. Our desire is to be close to you. We desire to be closer to you. Come on, Danny, begin to sing, make me holy. I pray right now our desire is to be close to you. We want to be like you. We want to sound like you. We want to forgive like you. We want to worship you. We want to be close to you. We want to forgive like you. We want to bless like you. We want to be like you. Jesus, we love you. Father, we love you. Spirit of the living God, we love you. 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 Would you make us holy? Come on, church, begin to pray. 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 Online campus, begin to pray. Come on, communities, begin to pray. And Canada, pray. And California, pray. And Austin, pray. And Houston, pray. And Waco, pray. Make me holy. your prayer language all over this place nobody's prophesying in tongues this is not out of biblical order this is a Jude 120 moment if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit this is a great time to receive it right now just say Holy Spirit fill me right now just start loving on him tell him he's holy over and over and over and over I've seen thousands of people get baptized by the in the Holy Ghost by just saying holy 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 come on pray in the Holy Ghost loose your prayer language come on sing in the spirit all over this place loose it right now
just showed me we're in a moment. We're in a spiritual moment of today that we will see the fruit in tomorrow. Over and over and over and over, I've watched where the Lord has me in spiritual moments, believe in faith and seeds are planted. And then I'll have a moment where I'll look up and I will see in fruition, I will see the tangible effect of what I sowed in faith months, weeks, or years prior. John Gardner, when I saw you come to your knees, I heard the Lord say, he's in a miracle. And I felt that there are miracles that are coming to your house. And then I saw miracles beginning to take place, not just physical. I just experienced the greatest miracle of my life and it wasn't physical, but it was a miracle. I saw God do what only he could do. I witnessed what I prayed and fasted for. I watched it happen before my very eyes and it wasn't a physical thing, but it was a spiritual thing. I saw something that was dead and dormant come alive and only God could do it. Those kind of miracles are in the room. Ah. And there's a seed of faith and worship. Just close your eyes tight all over this place. I want whoever has those flags, I want you to begin to turn in circles as we begin to play. And there's gonna be these winds of the presence of God that begin to blow through this place. Father, I pray right now, let your people be caught up in your glory. I felt so strong in my spirit. Miracles are gonna be released even now. I pray a miracle would take place in Austin, Texas with SB 14 from this moment right now. We're warring over our state. We're warring over our nation. Come on, loose your prayer language right now. As you pray in the Holy Ghost, miracles are being released. As you pray in the Holy Ghost, miracles are being released.
I am physically exhausted. But there's a little more war to do. I feel this so strong. You're not warring for today. You're warring for tomorrow. Heather, come and join me. We had a prayer night on Wednesday. And I saw an army of black political leaders coming out of mercy culture. <laughs> and they were fearless. And they weren't owned by any man or party. I saw the Lord raising up justice carriers into the political realm from this house. I'm gonna tell you one other story and then we're gonna war. As we were praying, I felt, I felt God doing miracles on your behalf. It was a personal moment. When I was on my knees, I felt the Lord say, now contend for Austin. When I was at Sean Foyt's event, let us worship at the Capitol, a friend of mine who pastors in the city sent me a message and he said, I had a dream. And in this dream, there was a sexually immoral person who was running with the football. He said, and I chased him down and I tackled him at the one yard line and at the one yard line, we got the ball back. I said, come on, you have to, sh you have to tell this to Nate Schatzlein, representative state is Nate Schatzlein. He begins to share it with him. Then he starts praying Zechariah four. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by the spirit of the Lord. Whoa. This is wild. I just saw something. As we were praying, as he was praying, I got caught up in the glory. I felt a swirl of the presence of God. Then I had a vision. What's a vision? It's a spiritual daydream. And I'm not making this up. I'm not adding to it. I saw Nate in his office with a group of Christians and they were falling like dominoes, one by one in his office. They were falling off. That's not a good fall, that's a bad fall. And they were lonely. They were by themselves fighting. Then all of a sudden, his office was full of warring angels. And one by one, they were bringing laws into the building where they vote on laws. Now, if you're unaware, Nate and a group of godly men and women are fighting for a bill called SB 14 that would ban the sex changes of minors in Texas. It's it's been shot down two times so far by court, uh, point of orders that, that get it to be legally dropped. There's, I think, three weeks or two and a half weeks left in session. I felt right now as we pray that we need to ask the Lord to send those warring angels back to the place where they vote, listen, to get this law passed. The scripture my friend prayed was it is not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. When I was standing right here on this stage, I saw the leaders that were dropping in Austin one by one. Ah, I just saw black leaders from our house going and refilling those places. Ah. I understand that we clap for those things. But this isn't a clap moment. This is a go to war moment. Breathe in the presence of God. Breathe in the presence of God all over this place. And I'm gonna count to three. And when I count to three, I want you to lift up a warfare shout. This is not of the flesh. 
This is not what we do at Gabe's. I want you to shout from your spirit. Some of you will even be baptized in the Holy Spirit as we shout. Some of you will be delivered of years of sexual perversion as we shout. But what I want to believe is that from this place right now, that the Spirit of God that abides here, that we send the warring angels to Austin right now to begin to fight on our behalf. Father, I pray right now the God of angels' armies would go from this place to that place in Texas, to the Austin State Courthouse. We declare the Lord rebuke you, every foul, perverted spirit that would try to harm and mutilate our children, that would cause our children to be puppeteers of Baal worship. We say we will not serve your gods of perversion, but we declare we will serve the Holy God, the one true God. I pray, Holy Spirit, come closer with everything you have. One, two, three.
to close out. I felt this awareness and I feel like I'm coming to understand of what I was trying to say in the first service, but that there has been a fear in the body of Christ of inviting a refining fire because it's uncomfortable. God disrupt our comfort. <laughs> disrupt this comfort that causes us to coward and fear. That causes us to dance to the songs of this culture unholy instead of crying out for holiness. God, today we say fear go. And we invite a refining fire, a holy fire that would purify your people in this army that you're calling in this hour. Come on right now, would you just invite the refining fire and say, you have access to my life. You have access to my marriage. You have access in our household. Refine whatever you want to refine. Take the unholiness out. Purify my from your teenagers. Oh, Lord, let holiness invade our homes. What is the point of holiness staying in a sanctuary 
are not filling our homes and filling our lives. So Lord, I pray that this hunger right here, this refining fire, this desire for holiness leaves with every person out this door. And I declare it goes into their car with them. It goes into the restaurant with them. It goes into their house, into their business, into their colleges, into their schools. I declare the refining fire goes with you, church. So Lord, right now, we just say thank you. Thank you for your refining fire. Thank you for purifying us. Thank you for your patience with us. Come on, can you just thank him for what he's done this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, King. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, he's good. His glory is here. How do you transition out of a moment like this? Father, I pray that this crushed religion's head today. I, cru I pray it crushed and took down the giant of religion. Oh, that Lord, we desire to be more and more intimate with you. So Lord, I pray today pleases you and tomorrow as thousands of people cry out for holiness, that it pleases you, Jesus. We give you all of the honor and all of the glory. We give you all of the honor and all of the glory, Jesus. Amen. If there's anything that you need prayer for, our prayer team will be down here. The ways to give, as always, are on the screen. Let me bless you. Exodus 33, 13. I declare over you, Lord, teach us your ways that we may know you and find your favor. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you, Mercy Culture Church. Blessings.